Origin wants to build solar panels on the moon, from the moon. SpaceX sold its floating landing pads, and another asteroid hits Earth exactly where and when astronomers predicted. All this and more in this week's episode of Space Bites. If we're going to want to set up a permanent base on the moon, we're going to need to send a lot of stuff from Earth. And the moon, although it's just like it's right there in the sky, it's actually at the top of a giant gravitational hill. And it's very expensive for us to carry all of the stuff that you would need to take to the moon. Like think about all the food, the water, the air, all of the building supplies, all of the electronics, gadgets, everything. And so the more we can build stuff on the moon, the better it's going to be. And of course, this is in situ resource utilization. And a lot of researchers are working on ways to do this, build stuff on the moon out of the moon. And Blue Origin announced this week that they have successfully created all of the raw materials to build solar panels out of lunar regolith. Now they didn't use actual lunar regolith, like that stuff's expensive. But they use simulated regolith, which is matching the chemical composition and the materials that you'd find on the moon. They put the regolith into an electric furnace, melted it down, and they were able to purify it to about 99.999% purity. And that's the level that you would need to be able to create solar cells. And they were also able to create the kind of glass that you would put in front of solar cells. So you can imagine this future where you've got this factory that sits on the surface of the moon, scoops up regolith, heats it up using solar power, and then generates solar cells complete with the glass in front of them out on the surface of the moon that then astronauts can use to power their space station. And I, I, I just like I love this idea and more and more of this kind of work is going to help us set a more permanent habitation in space. SpaceX sold Phobos and Deimos. It sounds like SpaceX just sold two of Mars moons, but that's not what happened. Back in 2020, SpaceX purchased two oil rigs, and their plan was to refurbish them and use them as landing pads for Starship. Now we know Starship is gigantic. It's going to create an enormous amount of heat and noise when it lands, maybe too much noise to be close to a city center. And so what they wanted to do was have Starship land on floating oil platforms out in the ocean where the noise won't be quite as loud for residents at nearby communities. And then you could ship people cargo and stuff to and from these oil platforms. And so they bought these two platforms and they named them Phobos and Deimos and they started to retrofit them. But that's like the last we heard of this. And then at a recent conference, SpaceX president when Shotwell announced that they had sold the two oil platforms. And she didn't really go into the specifics, just that they weren't going to work out. And so now when you look at the launch facility at Boca Chica with the Mechzilla that's able to catch these falling boosters and starships, that we're probably going to see this be the plan for the long term. But they didn't rule out using oil platforms in the future. So maybe 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, we'll see something that's more robust, that's designed to land starships away from city centers from all that heat, noise and potential danger. Another asteroid hit Earth and we were expecting it. A few months ago, we talked about an asteroid that was detected about a day before it hit the Earth and then it exploded in the atmosphere above Canada. And now astronomers have done this again. This is the seventh time that astronomers have detected an asteroid on a collision trajectory with Earth. And we think about it like it's been 10 years since the Chelyabinsk impact detonated over Russia, like the most powerful meteor explosion that we've seen in modern history. The object was designated 2023 CX one. It was found by Christian Sarneski using a 60 centimeter telescope in Hungary and astronomers were able to track the asteroid and realize that in about eight hours, it was going to explode in the atmosphere above the English Channel. So halfway in between France and England and right on schedule, astronomers went out, stared at the sky in the right location and boom, there was this bright fireball that lit up the sky. 
And I think there's a couple of things that I find really exciting about this story. Like one obviously is that we're getting better and better at detecting asteroids and meteors before they impact the atmosphere. And these are just like one meter across. They're not dangerous at all. But you can imagine some of the bigger ones out there, the, the bigger the space rock, the more time we'll get in advance to detect it before it's going to collide with the Earth. And maybe we can have some chance to mitigate or at least like evacuate areas if we think it's going to hit someplace that's populated. But the other part is that we now for the first time have a chance to sightsee meteors. And so we think about it like I've seen one bright fireball in my life and I've spent a lot of time out looking at the night sky. I've talked to a lot of other people, you know, most astronomers have seen a handful. But imagine if you could get a notification on your phone that a bright meteor is going to be hitting the atmosphere within the next eight hours, 10 hours, three days, and you can hop in your car and you can go to the right location, you can set up your telescope and you can watch the sky and see this happen right on schedule. It seems really surreal to me. And yet this might be the world that we're heading towards. So if you've never seen a bright fireball, you may have your chance soon. Astronomers find a galaxy made almost entirely of dark matter. Traditionally, dark matter and galaxies go hand in hand. Whenever you find a galaxy, you also find this large dark matter halo that is surrounding the galaxy, giant galaxy clusters surrounded by giant halos of dark matter. But astronomers have also found examples that break these rules. They found galaxies without dark matter, and they found galaxies that are almost entirely dark matter. And they're not entirely sure why this happens, but it probably has something to do with galaxy interactions where galaxies collide with each other and the stars get separated from the dark matter and they kind of move off into different blobs. And then you're left with just a dark matter galaxy and you're left with just a star galaxy with no dark matter. But astronomers in China found one that's really close, only about a million light years away. So that's closer than Andromeda. And they were able to detect that it has clouds of gas and dust and a surrounding halo of dark matter, but almost no stars, no bright objects contained within this cloud. But this is exciting for a couple of reasons. Like one is that you've just got this thing that's close and so you can study it. But the other one is that this starts to help explain one mystery in astronomy, which is called the dwarf galaxy problem. And essentially, when you count up the mass in the universe, there should be more dwarf galaxies than astronomers have been finding. And it might be because in fact, a lot of these dwarf galaxies are just blobs of dark matter with gas and dust. When you think about it, galaxies have large amounts of gas and dust like the stuff that's left over from the Big Bang. But these clouds need some kind of event to collapse down, you need some kind of nearby supernova, or some kind of galaxy collision that causes the gas and dust to start this collapsing process to turn into these new stars. Well, what if you've got a dwarf galaxy that is so small that it's never had a supernova that's never been close to another galaxy. And so it's never had anything that's triggered the star formation inside this cloud. And so you could end up with a galaxy that has just never had any star formation because it just never got the seeds to start it. And if this is the case, if this is one example, maybe astronomers are gonna find other examples, this might help explain this missing dwarf galaxy problem. There's another coolant leak on a Russian spacecraft. I right, remember when the Russian Soyuz capsule was leaking coolant into space and Russia blamed a micrometeorite impact on the spacecraft and at this point, it looks like they're not gonna be able to use the Soyuz, they're gonna to have to replace it with another one. Well, it turns out another Russian spacecraft is leaking coolant. This time it's with the Progress 82 spacecraft that is attached to the International Space Station. The Progress are uncrewed cargo vessels, they carry fuel and supplies up to the space station. And this one's been docked to the space station for several months. The astronauts have been filling it with garbage and the plan is for it to detach and re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and burn up. And as the new progress, the replacement progress was approaching the station, Progress 83, they realized that the Progress 82 had been leaking coolant. And although it's a different spacecraft than the Soyuz, it uses roughly the same coolant system. So one coolant leak, sure, you can explain that on a micrometeorite, two coolant leaks on the same system? 
maybe there's a problem with the coolant system. So there's no risk to the astronauts on board the station at this point. I mean, they're going to detach this cargo vessel and burn it up anyway. And the new one's going to, I guess, going to have a new coolant system on board. But still, I think at this point, Russia is going to have to take this a little more seriously and try and get to the bottom of what is the common problem that's facing these spacecraft. <laughs> yeah, 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 my, yeah, micrometeorites love to hit Russian spacecraft. That's that's the answer. Targeted hits on Russian spacecraft. Now, if you enjoy the work that we do here with Space Bites, I want to recommend a type of content on our channel that you're probably skipping. And those are the interviews. The interviews are the conversations that I have with experts in the field, astronomers, astronauts, space scientists, people who work at the space agencies, mission controllers, all kinds of things. And they're often longer, they're an hour to an hour and a half. And they're very in depth. Like a lot of people say to me that a lot of the content that we do here on this channel, both with the question show and even with these space bites is fairly introductory, fairly, you know, beginner level. While with the interviews, I'm taking this right to the very edge of my knowledge, I'm exploring the ideas and the answers that I don't know. And I'm getting this from the experts who are doing this work. And so if you want to take your knowledge of space a little further, if you want to understand really what's going on at the cutting edge of space and astronomy research, you should listen to the interviews. They're really good. In fact, they're my favorite content. They're the part where I'm learning stuff that's brand new that I've never seen before. And I have a really good time doing it. You see the length of the interview and you're like, yeah, maybe, maybe not watch them. They're really good really interesting. I'll give you three that we did that were absolutely fascinating. One was this recent interview about sending a realistic crew mission to Mars. And this was with Rick Davis. He's the guy at NASA who is trying to figure out the best place to land Mars missions. There's the interview that I did with Lee Feinberg, who works with the Hubble Space Telescope and James Webb Space Telescope. And you can really see why he's doing one of the most important jobs with JWST. And then the other conversation that I had was with Andrew Higgins on just out of the box ideas to figure out how we can travel to other stars, very practical and yet ideas that you may have never heard before. And those are the kinds of interviews that we do here on the channel. So if you haven't already, don't skip them watch them. And if you don't have time to watch them on YouTube, just like listen to them on the podcast, you can just like run it at high speed, 1.5 speed, double speed, and listen to the interview. And I promise you will learn new things. Astronomers find a rogue supermassive black hole. We've been talking about rogue stars here on the channel for a few weeks now with you've got some kind of event that kicks a star on a trajectory that's going to carry it out of the galaxy that it's in. So let's scale this up a notch. Astronomers have found a rogue supermassive black hole. This is a supermassive black hole with millions of times the mass of the sun that is on an escape velocity trajectory from the galaxy cluster that it was in. So how do you get a rogue supermassive black hole? Astronomers think that when galaxies come together and they merge, because the black holes are the densest parts of these galaxies, they find their way, they sink down to the bottom of this merging galaxy cluster, and they find one another. And if you've got a couple of black holes, they will often merge into a more massive black hole. But if you've got multiple black holes that are sort of spinning around each other in this area, one of them can get kicked out. It's like a recoil that comes out of the center of this galaxy cluster. And there's even mechanisms that have been proposed where you've got like one very massive black hole and one that's a lot less massive as they whip around each other, they can actually recoil and the smaller black hole can get kicked right out of the galaxy. And astronomers think they found one. It's located at the core of a galaxy cluster that is quite far away. And they've been able to track this trail of debris in its wake. They know for sure that it is a supermassive black hole, but they're not entirely sure that it is on this escape trajectory. But they can see this 30 light year long trail behind it, where you've got clouds of gas and dust, and new star formation, where I talked about this early in the episode, you need some kind of event that will begin this process of star formation. Well, a rogue black hole passing through this region is just the kind of event you'd want to begin this process of star formation. So we're still waiting for more confirmation. But if it's true, it's pretty exciting news. There's a mass migration of stars in Andromeda. Astronomers have been studying the location and 
direction of movement of stars in Andromeda, which is of course this giant galaxy that is relatively close to the Milky Way. Astronomers have been using the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, which is a telescope that is similar to the Gaia mission, but not the Gaia mission. And you know, I always talk about how wonderful Gaia is, how many amazing discoveries have been made. So similar to Gaia, the dark energy spectroscopic instrument uses astrometry to detect the movements of objects, and they've been tracking stars in Andromeda. And what the astronomers have found is about 7000 stars are moving together in a way that shows that they're once part of a separate galaxy that merged with Andromeda probably about 2 billion years ago. And astronomers have found many examples of this here within the Milky Way, thanks to Gaia and other methods of astrometry, they will able to find these streams of stars that are moving around the galaxy. And so it shows that the history of Andromeda's formation is very similar to the history of the Milky Way's formation, that Early on in the galaxy's history, there was probably one large event that brought a lot of stars into the inner halo of the galaxy. But then over time, over billions of years, it snacked on additional smaller galaxies one at a time, and most recently about 2 billion years. Those were all the news stories that we had today. Of course, we'll have links to every story that I talked about in the show notes down below. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at university.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Maud Sue, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Josh Schultz, and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us. All right, that was all the news that we had for today. We'll see you next week.